hey what's going on everyone it is friday afternoon out here on the west coast friday evening on the east coast it could be saturday if you happen to live on the other side of the world wherever you are it is time for cinema crusaders the show where we take a look at older movies that we think deserve to have a second look we review them we break them down and we hope we hope that we inspire you to go back and check these movies out if you haven't watched them before or Check them out again if it's been a while since you watched them in the first time because they are on our list to look at for a reason. So tonight we are going to be talking about a film that I was not personally familiar with before I had seen it. It was a great recommendation from one of my fellow crusaders, Lance Lucero. It is 1987's Barfly starring Mickey Rourke and Faye Dunaway as well as the underappreciated Frank Stallone. And we're going to get into that a little bit as well. But there's a whole bunch to talk about in this film. And I'm really looking forward to talking about it and why I had passed over it for years and what a mistake that was. Uh, I will say real quick before I introduce uh, Lance that both Jeff and Steve are not with us tonight. I wish them all the best. And I hope that they are doing well. And we look forward to having them back next time. But enough of that i'm going to introduce my fellow cinema crusader who is here to break down this film with me we're going to talk all about it there's so much exciting stuff to talk about um really really interesting film i'm talking about the man behind warehouse nine go to warehouse nine pro.com and check out all the stuff there he's also behind the big book of bob non you psychic volume one which is over on the anyone world.com he is a consummate professional film creator multi-talented and he always turns me on to the best 70s and 80s movies that i hadn't seen i'm talking about none other than lance lucero how you doing lance i'm doing good i'm doing good and in the spirit of bukowski this is a uh single barrel five-year-old bourbon it's probably more high class than what he would drink but i figured it would be appropriate for this evening um cheers awesome well since i can't really drink anymore for a variety of reasons please take a slug for me when you get a chance as well so you know. i heard that <laughs> let's see and oh cool hex allen says yes i love this movie i'm a big bukowski fan awesome, fantastic awesome. so um so let's get right into this and start right there you know because hex brings up a great place to start i think which is the guy who wrote the screenplay for this film the guy whose life this is semi based on um the guy who had a huge amount of influence i would say outsized influence in today's world on who is going to be the actor um who is going to direct a whole host of things um a multi multi-talented writer uh, he wrote short stories, screenplays, and novels, you know, something that I could aspire to as well. Um, I'm talking about Bukowski. Um, why is this first name escaping me first? Henry Charles. Yes, Henry Charles Bukowski. So from Los Angeles, from my neck of the woods. Um, one of the things that I saw, and then I'm going to kick it right over to you, Lance, and because I want to hear what you say about this guy as well. But one of the things that I loved is there are two things that, uh, you know, I was doing my research about Bukowski that he said um one is just a general comment that i'm going to bring up in a moment but the second one was about mickey Rourke in particular um not only was he a writer but he didn't just drop off the screenplay and leave it and go and take his money and go on his way he was in there during filming he was watching the performances and everything and he appreciated what mickey Rourke brought to the character that bukowski had written and that Mickey Rourke made that character his own and then brought his, as Bukowski said, his own form of madness to the character. And we're going to talk about that when we talk about Mickey Rourke. But I think that was just an incredible comment and about how impressed Bukowski was by another creator, another artist, taking his art and bringing it to life. You know, and I'm sure that you've had those experiences yourself as someone who writes movies and, and directs them as well. The second part second comment that i want to make about the man before i kick it over to you was that someone asked bukowski once about how do you become a writer i hear this question all the time i sometimes i ask this question and he said you don't try you said you never try you just sit and you wait and you wait for the idea to come to you and then if it's if it's ugly you slap it and you kill it and if it's beautiful and wonderful you grab it and hold on to it and bring it to life and i thought i thought that's just such an amazing comment and really if i think about it 
That's the best ideas I've ever had have been the same way where I'm not trying. I just sit there and then it occurs to me. So it's, it's pretty cool, you know, that this guy who was so accomplished uh, did that, you know, so it said those types of things. And um, yeah, you know, it, it's just, I have to thank you for bringing this movie and this man to my attention. I Bukowski as a writer had been on my radar and I've read some of his stuff, but this movie I had passed on for years and mostly it was because of the cover art. And I know we're going to talk about that as well, but let's get really in quick into Bukowski, the screenplay and what he did, you know, the man and what he did bringing this movie to a studio and getting it brought to life. So over to you, Lance. Well, Bukowski is a big deal. I mean, you know, poet, philosopher, uh, study of the human condition, um, which I think is is where it's at. You don't, you know, those pulp writers of the, of the 50s and 60s and such, like a Jim Thompson, um, uh, which really explore humanity. I think that's where the meat of humor and horror is, truly. Yeah. Um, and, this, and that's why Buk Bukowski turns me on, you know, not so much the poetry, uh, uh, but the stories, the experience. And he's one of those guys that he's right. Um, subconsciously, I would do that. I would not force myself to write. I would wait. And I wanted to experience. I wanted to always be, I want the dirty details of every story. And I don't care what it is if I'm talking to anybody. It's like, okay, you have a story. Well, let me hear it. And I want to know it firsthand. Um, and I get the idea of waiting for that story to come to you. Uh, I mean, I think it's fantastic to wait just to absorb an environment, to do all that, that fantastic stuff to get the story. So I think that's, that's where his, his genius comes into light and him being a, a consummate professional. I mean, you know, Barbe Sch Schroeder, uh, contacted him in 1979 to write this screenplay and Bukowski kept hanging up. On him and he's like i'll pay you twenty five thousand dollars and that got his attention and it's basically chronicling his excerpts of his existence and finding the right performer to translate that which which happened to be mickey rourke and i think that's one of those genius moments of casting uh it, it just worked out perfectly um yeah. keep going keep going it's it's that rare slice in time, everything just worked out right. And you got to just go with it. But I think that's what makes it entertaining too. And yeah, it's misleading. You know, the, the title, uh, a lot of the, the marketing and the cover art is, is, does not do uh, the, the film justice. Um, even when it, when it premiered at Cannes uh, that year, 1987, 88, you know, the French, even though a Barbe Sh uh, for, uh, Schroeder is, is uh, French, he was saying they didn't get it. They thought it was this hardcore drama where the Americans were laughing. They were laughing at the right moment because it's humor. This is just the humoristic aspect of humanity. And I think that's where the genius comes in, being able to take those horrific stories and put that humorous twist on there. Not even really trying to make it funny, but just the way people talk and the interactions, that's humorous. And you could get that in a conversation at a bar. I'm not saying go to a bar and look for that. Yeah. I'm saying that this was a different time where people had a sense of humor. It wasn't as bad as it is today. People could laugh constantly, even at their predicament. It doesn't exist today. So that's why I say it's a slice of, of life. It's a slice of a time frame. And I think Bukowski was able to capture the essence of humanity perfectly. Um, this is what I strive for. This is what I think is storytelling at its best. So... This is where this is where I think entertainment comes in. You know, uh, uh, truth is stranger than fiction. So just write the truth. And I think absolutely. you're going to get it. Yeah, I, I agree with what Heck says here. You know, it absolutely is. It's it's listing. And, and you can see that it's something, you know, I'm not I'm not going to dunk on on modern movie making or modern storytelling. But a lot of what we do now is the fantastical. And this is a kind of movie that doesn't get made much anymore. It's a look. It's you know, we were talking last week about period pieces because we were looking at um, the Last Samurai, you know, completely different movie, but similar in the sense that, you know, we're recreating a, a period in time, you know, and then we're putting people in there and we're following their lives. And The Last Samurai is much more fantastical than this, 
but it's the same concept where we're opening up a window into a slice in time and we're looking at the people existing there and what we get is what we get and and i think that's where the 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 as a writer where that waiting and watching comes in because if you take the time to wait and watch and look around you there are stories going on all the time that you could tell it's just that we don't notice you know and so um and i think that that has been lost to a, a certain degree by all of us you know and i think getting back to that can only be a good thing absolutely um, now with that said um I, I do want to get to the actors and we're going to go to them next, but I want to get to um, the canvas that all of this set is, that this is set on, which is Los Angeles. And I come from this area. I live, you know, I grew up here. I live in this area. I'll say from the very beginning, uh, and maybe this is one of those American things that you were talking about with the French. I was smiling just from the very beginning as they are showing the streets and showing the bars. Cause I'm like, it's the classic American dive bar and the classic American flop house above the dive bar and the whole thing. And I remember growing up and my dad and all of my family didn't go there, but there was that part of town you drove through, drove through and you saw those people and, and you interacted with those people. I remember an old man who lived in a, in a home across the way from where I lived, who would come over and I was 15 years old. He'd come over and he'd sneak me some money to go buy him cigars and, and whiskey, you know, and somehow I was able to do it and I bring it back to him. You know, it's that type of thing. It's that slice of life, slice of Americana. And there was something, even now, I mean, this movie is, uh, how old is this movie? Uh, 30 something years old. It's like, yeah, it's old. Yeah. Watching this, it just made me smile. It made me remember a different time and it transported me back to a different time. And it was beautiful. And then to realize that all of this is filmed on location, it gives you that gritty lived in feel because it is gritty and lived in. And there are some technical innovations that they came up with to be able to film in these locations. And I'm going to kick it over to you in a second because I want you to talk a little bit about film, you know, which you love to talk about, I know, but you know, I want to hear it again in this, but I want you to talk about, the, the lighting specifically because filming in these you know if you've ever been in one of these flop houses you've ever been in one of these dive bars it's dingy it's dusky it's not going to show up well on film video doesn't matter what you're doing unless you have the right lighting but if you overlight it it's going to look uh artificial and unnatural so they had to come up with the right way so i want to talk to you about that you know, and I'm going to pass it over to you talk to us about those challenges and what you saw in this film because it's so impressive to me and I'm a layman. I want to hear what you have to say about this, you know, watching this movie. Well, from the get go, like like the opening scene, just showing the the, okay. the exteriors of the, of the bars that were heavily researched, you know, to say, OK, these these are the main haunts of, of, of I don't know, the underprivileged to the underclassed, whatever. Um, but they were prominent fixtures in the city. I mean, like I, it makes me smile too. It makes me think of East Colfax. It makes me think of South Broadway. It makes me think of Washington Street, South Washington Street here in Colorado. All the neon lights, all the gimmicks, all even the bars. I'll interject. Mm -hmm. It even takes me back to shows like Dragnet from the Fifth Dragnet. Day. Yeah, this is this is old LA old LA the way it was, you know? So yeah, definitely. And it's gone, you know, yeah. uh, I think only one location, uh, the exterior of a, of a, of a hospital exists. Every, it's gone. That was a slice in Americana that doesn't exist anymore. And talking about the canvas, I think what's unique is that, you know, Barbet Schroeder being French, um, I always love the foreign eye on Americana because it does offer a different kind of a different perspective. They don't gloss it up. It's like they see America for what it is and they want to capture it for what it is. Um, just like a John uh, a Schlesinger, uh, Midnight Cowboy, you know, he he captures New York the way it is. He's British. You look at Vim Vendors, who does, let's say, a Paris, Texas, and he, you get the Southwest, this road movie from the eye of a German, uh, of foreigners. And I love their perspective of America because to me, it's a little bit more truthful. I'll be honest with you. You could even take that into things like the Spaghetti Western. Where, yes, Sergio you know, Leone. I mean, yeah. it, it goes on and on. But I love the idea of seeing foreigners capture what, what their perspective of is Americana. And I think it translates to the truth. And I think that's what works. And of course, they're used to working 
a little differently than Americans. They don't have the big studios. Uh, they don't have all the grand lighting. They don't have all that. They're used to working a little bit more on the fly independently. Let's use a real location, which is extremely difficult difficult to do in its own right production wise, but they were still able to do that. I mean, you know, the golden horn was a real bar. The inside of it was real. The alleyway was right out back where they were fighting. And I guess the biggest complaint is just how bad LA smelled. I mean, that's what they were saying when they were shooting all the time. It was the smell that was killing them, but it also got people into character because that's what they needed. So the canvas is extremely important. And I mean, L.A. is Bukowski's town. Yeah, sure, he was New York, Philadelphia, but L.A. is his town. He knew the topography of all of it. He knew the ins and outs. So what what better way to write about than what you know? So I think it worked out fantastically. And this this is a very difficult movie to shoot, extremely difficult, you know, to not have the big lighting kits, the grip trucks, everything that's necessary for a so-called Hollywood production. So, you know, I love it. I love it. This is, this is what your canvas is, is film and film stock. It is just fantastic. So we had a question from Hex. Uh, what is your take on the big fight or duel that was the climax of the film? Uh, and you don't have to answer right away, but I'm asking now. So what'd you think about that? How, how the film, um, well, I'm going to let you answer, and then I, I know what my thought is on it as well. So, Well, I think that I'm glad they didn't didn't show it. Uh, you know, it just went out into the alleyway, and it just ended. You don't, We don't know how it ended. You know what I mean? And I think that's the beauty part of it. Did he prevail again, or did he lose? It's, it's hard to tell, and I love that ambiguity of it. And I think it's just, once again, like you said, we, we open the pages of this person's life, and then it, the book is still open when the, when the bar, bar door closes. It's like, okay, well, what happened? Eh, the same old, same old, maybe. But I, I, I love that ambiguity. I love how we did not need to go there and just leave it as it was. You know, with the addition of Wanda, that was probably the highlight. You know, what was her interaction? We'll never know. Um, I, I like the way it ended. I like the way it ended. From a pure storytelling perspective, I look at this. Um, this is not the kind of story that I'm most comfortable telling. It'd be interesting to try, but this is not your narrative, you know, point A, point B, point C, um, you know, three act type story or film or anything like that. This is what you, you said, where we're literally we're opening it. And I love from a filmmaker and storyteller's perspective that we bookmark or bookend the film basically on the same scene you know we came in with this going on and we went out with this going on saying a whole host of things i mean if i want to get philosophical a bit about it i could say that henry has gone through all this and learned nothing he's right back where he was or maybe he's a changed man but circumstances dictate he's right back where i mean there's so much room to, to theorize and, and philosophize about, you know, these types of things. Right. Is he superhuman because he's now in love? You know, yeah. I mean, he, does he have something to lose? I mean, this is all, yeah. this is all great stuff. And, and, and it's a type of storytelling um, that is very effective, but you have to be very talented to do. Because otherwise, when you're watching or reading this type of story, you feel like, what's the point? What was I doing? you know, the whole time, I, you know, as a, as a reader or as a viewer, you come out of it going, what did I get out of this? But when it's done effectively, you come out going, I empathize with the characters. And now that uh, my window is closed, I want to know more. Absolutely. And, and it's not there. So, um, yeah, I mean, kudos. I mean, it, it's, it's, I don't think you could, you know, to, to answer Hex's question directly, I don't think you could end this movie any other way. You have to bookend it so that we go out the way we came in. And that leaves you with so much to talk about and think about that. Um, I, I, I'll say it. It's genius. It's absolute genius. Yes, you know? it is. It is. Yeah. It is. And I even like how even at the end, you know, the, the slogan of, of the Golden Horn is a friendly place as they 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 spiral in, into uh you know chaos again but at the beginning of the film i was always looking at 
the terrible mat they put over that slogan so it could be a reveal in in the end of the movie they have like a blurred mat so you don't see it at the beginning of the film and they they angle the camera down in the daytime mm-hmm. so you don't see it but i think i think it was pretty clever how how the reveal worked in the end and yeah. it's, it's it's the old watering hole man you know that's just where people hang out they fight yeah. they love they fight again uh and it's it's a community of people and it's not always it's not a pretty community you know, it's not always a peaceful community, but it's a community. And so, you know, uh, we get to be part of that. And let's be honest, um, this movie, there was a TV show at the same time that though it didn't pre- present as ugly a version of the watering hole, it was just as popular for the same reasons, which was cheers. Cheers. Yeah. You know, so um it, it's it's this idea that i think maybe has gone away i don't know i've never been a big bar person i don't know if that's still popular the dive bar i i know it is in some places but um you know for the people that frequent there they are a family with all of that 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 entails you know and and so that's what may, another reason what that this movie is so good let's get into the technical stuff though i really wanted to hear your you know about the lighting in particular because um You know, a lot of films and TV shows at this time were on location filming. Um, You know, I mentioned before we came on the air, Starsky and Hutch had that look. And some of it was was, uh, soundstage, but a lot of it was on location, you know, especially exterior stuff. Um, How did you get, how do you get that lighting? And what were the innovations that they came up with particular for this film to be able to film in like cramped, 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 uh, you know, flop house rooms and stuff like that? Um, well, I mean, you got to hand it to Robbie Mueller. I mean, the guy's a genius, a cinematographer extraordinaire. He's one of my favorites, uh, just like Laszlo Kovacs um, of, the, of the 60s, 70s, 80s. These guys were, they knew every camera, they knew every lens, they knew every filter. These dudes, that was their thing. I mean, I've seen, I've seen just a, a, a production photo of like, say, um, Wanda's apartment, just like the bedroom. And then I, I, I had seen how he used a spot meter to hit every angle of light in that photograph and all the F stops associated uh, shows associated with that one photograph. And there was like 10 different F stops uh, for the entire scene. And I'm, I'm confused about how the, how the hell did he do that? And why wouldn't you just like the subject? But the guy was thinking in different dimensions, light and color wise. So that's why every every shot of this film is a glamorized, ugly glamour shot, mm-hmm. and it works perfectly. And it's it's not easy to do. Uh, the the uh, the Juana's apartment, you know, those are real windows. That's looking out into the real landscape of Los Angeles, with that bright sun blasting in. And the film stocks were a heck of a lot different and, then. And yet we don't get a lot of times if it's not shot well. Um, it's, you just get this washed out, which they were trying to avoid. And they were talking about, they were talking about putting the maximum ND filter on the lens to diffuse it so that the image wouldn't get blown out. And it worked perfectly. Um, and you know, shooting, shooting my feature hunting for fish. Um, I, I was kind of looking at that hotel or that, um, apartment complex when we were shooting in a hotel, uh, Greystone Castle, which is actually just a mile mile away from me, and we were shooting in a tower where there were windows about about 180 degree of windows in Colorado, which means the sun here is not like anything. It's way more intense than Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. And we had all this light to work with, but different film stocks today. But we didn't use a filter. What we did is we filtered the windows. We put 85 filter on all the windows because the sun was moving and all we moved was a key light. And in my mind, I was thinking barfly the whole time. Like, how the hell did he light it? Because we seemed to do it reasonably in a simple manner. Whereas they had 35 millimeter cameras, they had probably a bigger crew, and we were still cramped in one room. They were still able to do it and make it look fantastic with the use of the Kino Flow, an early example of a fluorescent light that didn't flicker as much and that could emit uh, the right color temperature, which worked fantastically um, back then. That was extremely difficult to do back then. You know, uh, me doing it 10 years later uh, with different and faster film stocks, it was really no problem. 
We, we, we didn't have to contend with what they had to contend with 10 years earlier. So that, those are the advancements of film. And I love it. I mean, that it gives you that dirty documentary style, but in a very glamorized way. It was still lit. There was mm -hmm. still reflecting light, which brings out the dirty highlights in the walls and the wallpaper, which, which, gives, your, which gives your performers uh, more to work with with their character because now they are that character. I mean, the, the, the nice rim light behind them, whether it's neon, sunlight, bar light, street light. I mean, uh, Robbie, Robbie Mueller was, was a genius. And yeah. if only I can photograph that well, you know, there's a lot more studying I have to do. But man, this is a great movie to look at. Every shot is an ugly glamour shot. I love it. Well, talking to someone who just likes cinema, I have to say the one the, the shots that really spoke to me were the ones that were inside Henry's room in the, the hotel, you know, in the flop house. Um, being able to see all of the cracks in the paint so well and, and to be able, you know, in a dimly lit room, but be able to see everything that I need to see, to see the, the rips and tears in the blinds as he pulls them down. I mean, everything about it, um was incredibly well lit and dim at the same time and i don't know how you pull that off but whoever did it did it well you know it's he's a genius yeah. yeah and and i will always say it you know I, what i don't see in in the new video shooting is a key light because they can't do a good key light on video otherwise it's going to look like soap opera or it's going to look like a saturday morning kid show it's not going to have the tip the, the depth and the texture as film and that's where it's falling short. And people are trying to say, well, how do we make it look like film? Well, let's just not use a key light and let's let the foreground look a little dim and our performers are failing and let's let it fall into muddiness in the background. It's like, that's not great photography and that's not doing your performers justice. I get it, performers need to eat. So it doesn't matter if it's video, film, on stage, whatever, they need to do their job. But I think, Digital so-called cinema, you know, is killing performances. I think when you have those performers there, you got to give them their all. You really got to help them. And I this is an example of how great it works. I have to say the final thing I'll say on this, and then we're going to get on to the act, the the actors and actresses. Um, you know, we were talking a little bit about the foreigners looking at Americana, but. Um, I think that it's also a style, you know, and I think you would probably agree with that. And this reminds me of another movie we covered, and I can't recall the name. It's the one where the guy took a picture and, ca and caught a murder. Oh, a uh, uh, blow up. Blow up, yeah. It's, it's, that, it's, the, it's, it's a European style. Um, it's, it's, it's a culture. It's a way that they intend to look at life you know, and, and document life, you know, those types of things. Um, and I appreciate it, you know, and, and as someone who is never going to go near film school or creating a film, um, I wish that more people would, would try and learn from that. You know, it's like, I can take stuff out of it as a writer looking at it on ways to do stuff, you know? So I, I think it's very, I very much appreciate what they do. And I think sometimes, um, you know, when I was younger, I had a tendency to be like, oh, foreign films, you know, but it's like, it's cool to look at the way that foreigners look at different things to be able to broaden your horizons. Same thing with like the Japanese, I'm a big horror film. You know, you watch a Japanese horror film, it is a completely different animal than the American horror film. And I'm here for it. I love it, you know, so uh, very, very cool stuff. Um, so let's get into the, I'm going to, I'm going to go with three performances. So, and I'm, I'm going to start with uh, not the main, the main performer. I want to start with Faye Dunaway first. Um, uh, the thing I'm going to start off with her, and I'm going to start off with from a technical perspective, is that Faye Dunaway is just a naturally glamorous person. You know, she's got the charisma that you always talk about. She's beautiful. Um, this was back uh, when, um, you know, she was very much still an in-demand actress. She still is, you know, um, for, but this was, you know, right around her heyday. Um, and yet brave enough to allow the production crew to ugly her up because it required it. And she still has that glamour and beauty coming through. And there's a reason character wise why it does, but you know, 
it's one of those things and i don't i don't want to dunk on modern movie making and modern film stars but it's like you got to be brave you got to allow yourself to look you know ugly or in the case of mickey work look absolutely insane in this film absolutely in order to tell the story and so um you know over to you on faye dunaway you know i'm sure you have a lot to say but what do you think about her job acting wise which i thought she was very good in it but also the production what they did with her in the film well i mean she, she's a supermodel you know what i mean she's 100 percent glamour i mean the beautiful high cheekbones um you know the structure her structure um everything about her is just just screams of glamour mm -hmm. and, and i know that uh barbe schroeder was 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 very intent on not capitalizing on that. Uh, she's a good performer and that's all that was needed. But, you know, they did many, many tests to get the right amount of grease in her hair. They did many, many tests to tone down the makeup, uh, uh, but still have her wearing somewhat um, professional clothing to make it look like maybe she did come from some kind of money. Um, obviously, you know, you, you, you see that she tries to take care of herself, but, I, I, we talked about the, the distraction in, in films where it looks like everybody just stepped out of a shower sometimes. And this is a, this is a film where it looks like nobody even showers. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> even if you see them in the bathtub, it doesn't look like they're clean. Um, you just can't wash it off. And I think it was, it was a genius route to go to grease up her hair, uh, you know, to tone down the makeup, but still have that pro professional, clothing on you know the, the cashmere uh yellows with the lavenders um the uh, the high-heeled shoes that were practical enough for her to run through a cornfield and evade police um everything about it was just perfect casting and it's production design now that production design gets you into character so that's what it was all about to get them into character and get them comfortable with looking unglamorous and it worked but let's let's take that what you just said and then go back to the movie art. She looks like a supermodel in the movie art. So does Mickey Work looks like a movie star in the movie art. And so I passed this movie by on the video. I used to work in a video store and we could take movies home at the end of the night. I passed it by forever because to me, this was just nine and a half weeks part two. You know, that's what I thought it was. And I wasn't interested in that. I didn't feel like taking that home. Um, and so it's like, it just goes to show you there's so much more into being a critical, you know, or a box office success than just creating a movie. It's the art, it's the the promotion, all of that stuff comes into play. Absolutely. And and you know, that that goes back to these 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 old film companies that are all defunct or on the verge of being defunct at the time like Canon Films, um Orion Films uh you know that were into the art they weren't corporately owned like what turned into what is now modern day movie making it's corporate it was owned they're owned by corporations gigantic corporations and they filter the money down into, into uh, films and productions for write-offs this is when they were all in or not you know what i mean this is where it was about the art and keeping costs low enough to try to try to make a profit and even if the movie's profitable, they didn't see it because they went under, you know, became profitable after the fact. But those are different times. And those are the times now that, you know, we as creators, we, we have to promote. I mean, a Warehouse Nine, a Raiden Cross Press, an Any One World, an ASAP, all that. It's like, okay, we are the new era of independence and the new uh, model for business rather than this corporate screen. Uh, structure, which is ruining everything. And Absolutely. this is also what's stated in Barfly. You know, I mean, it is pretty much anti everything. The idea that he states that who wrote the rule that we have to be somebody, have to do something, have to fall in line with society. You know, sometimes you, you think about all the things you don't want to be and you end up being, you know, that's the philosopher aspect of it. And that's, that defines Bukowski. And Henry in the movie, which I think is like, wow, I guess I've always thought that way. And it probably got me in more trouble than 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 it should have. But this whole idea of, well, no, I don't. Why do I need to go to film school and learn everything that everybody else is learning and talk exactly like what they do and, and, and talk about the same theories that they do? That's not freedom. All I need to know 
is the technical aspect of it and look at stories to be able to write. You know, uh, I don't want to be like anyone else. I don't want to model like anybody else, but I'm influenced by a lot of things. So that's the, that's the Bukowski concept, which I think exists in all us artists. It's like, you know, we are all in a sense, revolutionaries we're we're rebels because we kind of don't want to do what everybody else is doing so we try to go those those really hard roads to get our art done i think it's also requires a certain amount of um and this is going to get me because you've already mentioned him a little bit to henry it requires a certain amount of insanity and quite a lot of a bit of bravery because a sane person without that bravery to go out and do those things says the odds are stacked against me and doing this, uh, I have no guarantee of success. You know, I have no guarantee uh, that I'll even know where my next paycheck is going to come from. Absolutely. Know? I mean, it's Bukowski. I mean, he, he was a he was a federal employee for for 12 plus years. He worked for the post office. He was a mailman. He had a day job. And then he was starting to get press. He was starting to, to get attention for his poetry and his short stories. And he, he, he made the plunge. He was like, okay, I, I do I want to be a slave to this establishment and have to be forced to work with these psychotics for the rest of my life? Or do I risk starving to death trying to promote my art? He picked the starvation mm -hmm. road just so he can get his art going. And I, I can identify with that. I work too many dead end jobs. I've hurt myself too much over time. I'd rather starve doing my art. And, and I can identify with it as well. I mean, I, I took a different road. I think we each take our own road, but I will say I used to work a corporate job and slave to death and did all of that and made quite a nice living doing it, but I was miserable and I was not being who I am today. Uh, I'm also lucky though, that I have a partner, a wife who recognized that uh, her spouse was dying inside because of working the slave labor, you know? So, you know, uh, so I've got to give her, you know, and it was our anniversary yesterday. So I got to give her a shout out there. So, hey, um, you know, sometimes <laughs> you look, you look at the man and then you realize what's with the man. And uh, there's a reason why sometimes we call it the better half. Yeah, right? absolutely. You know? <laughs> so let's get into Mickey Rourke, you know, because uh, I will say to play insane, to play almost permanently drunk, and to make it come off so, I mean, that's kind of who Mickey Rourke was uh, for a lot of his career, his life anyway, but he does it so effortlessly, effortlessly. And from the very first moment I see him on film in this movie and the way he holds his jaw and the way he walks, his movements, his hand movements, everything about him screams, this guy is not all there. He's drunk off his ass. Uh, he is chaotic. However... However, when he gets into his art and we have the moments where he's sitting writing, he's almost angelic. He is, he like, inspiration is coming down through him and then beautiful words are flowing out. So I really have to agree with Bukowski in saying, I'm surprised how good he was in this film. Um, it's amazing. It's almost like, uh, this character matched up with him perfectly. I mean, and that's my take on it. What did you see from Mickey Wark in this in this movie? Because we were talking a little bit beforehand. Um, the wrestler up to, and I will say this just out of hand. Up until I saw this film, the wrestler was my favorite Mickey Wark performance. This takes it now. This one is above the wrestler, and I love the wrestlers. So. Oh yeah, I, I agree one hundred percent. And and think about the eighties. Now, what, what did we have? We had even bit parts Thank like you, uh, Thank you. like um, Fade to Black, where Mickey Rourke is still a supermodel. Good looking guy, supermodel. You know, we got Rumble Fish, where he's good looking guy, supermodel. You know, he, he was the, the hunk of the moment, um, the aspiring new Brando. And I, I see. I see. You're not talking about Harley Davidson and the Marlboro Man. I will never. I'm not even going to say it. <laughs> yeah, I'm not even going to say it. Yeah, we won't go there. That um, was the paycheck movie. So it, it had to have been because good God. All right. Anyway, moving on to his good stuff. Um, then, then this movie comes out, and I did see it in 1987, and I was blown away by it. I'm like, holy hell! That that is filthy. That is 
look look at his knuckles look at his teeth look at he he dove into that character and studied you know bukowski and they said it you know they said all those that knew him he he in a crowd or around women he had that machismo but in the moments when that was away he was gentle and angelic and he he was supportive you know there was like a duality in the character so i guess that comes through also in his writing when he's solitary so let me ask you a question i i i don't pretend to be an actor uh i've never been on a film set or done any of that however i've been around quite a few people have been drunk and tried to walk um how difficult is it to pull off the drunk walk where you are have to consciously try and get each limb to move and not fall over flat on your face but do that i'm assuming sober while he's filming this and make it look natural how difficult is that uh to direct and to get as an actor i i think well experience reigns supreme for a performer you know you have to experience and i think there was that duality of him being drunk and hurt all the time i mean he was hurt because of the fighting he he was limping so you saw coiffure extraordinaire right you seen a drunk guy yes and um i will look that up i don't know <laughs> no, I will. um you got you got to uh you got to go there with a performer like okay man do you have a drunken dad story you know what i mean it's like okay maybe i do maybe i don't um have you ever experienced that situation so that's where the performer has to dig deep and and play it off as okay if you're hurt and you're drunk how do you think you're going to move how do you you know how do you how do you think you're going to feel and i think that's where the performer has to has to has to delve into that darkness now now I'll say this and I haven't posted it. I'll probably post it as another behind the scene uh, on one of the social platforms. But Chris Rink sent me his initial thought of Coiffier, uh, extraordinaire of Legro being drunk. And, and a, he just set up his camera in, in the hallway in his house, put on a, an old wig and a, and a weird shirt and just came around the corner trying to keep his balance as though he was inebriated. And I was like, that's it. Let's just remember that for the for the production. So. As a, as a director, I have to give, I, I can only give them so much to get them there. It's up to them to get there. And if it's not there, that's when you yell cut and renegotiate. Um, <laughs> it's like, okay, we didn't get it right. Let's, let's think of a scenario. Let's think of something and let's work it out 20 times before we roll another take. Uh, as a director, that's what I do. Uh, I, I give the mo as, as much motivation as I can, but really it's up to the performer to get there. And the moment they're there, maybe I capture it one or two times, or maybe it doesn't seem like I did, but I'm like, okay, I got it. We're moving on. And they're like, are you sure I got it? Yeah, I got it. I see it. I know what I'm going to edit. So I got what I need. Let's move on. And you, you bury the past and you move on. Uh, but it's, it's, that's what makes performers great to work with. I mean, these people, they go there and I don't know how they do it. I don't want to be in front of the camera. I don't want to perform. I don't want this in, in front of on a big screen, <laughs> but they're brave. And yeah. you gotta, you gotta just abandon your ego and go for it. It's about the project, not about you. Oh, wow. That is such a crazy statement though, because, okay, this is what, you know, and, and I'm going to digress a little bit and bring it forward to the modern comic book movie. But this is my main complaint. As someone who loves superheroes and comics and everything, you just said you've got to abandon your ego and go for it. My huge rant about comic book movies is that masked characters take their masks off all the time. But this is all about that ego. It's like too many people don't seem willing to put their ego aside for the sake of the project whatever it is you know and and you know we all have our ego i've got my ego but it's like sometimes the project whatever it is you're working in on has to take precedence and i think that's such a incredibly important point you brought up there you know because you see that in this film you know from all of them 
Absolutely. And, you know, not not wa wanting to go down the, the comic book movie route, but if you look at Superman 1978 and you look at Christopher Reeve when Lois Lane dies and you see the pain in his face before he turns the world backwards, but you see the pain in his face, that's performance. That is no ego. That is a crushed character. So you got, I think there are many of a, perf a performer that would appreciate allowing them to go there, but I don't think the production, the corporation, the establishment allows them to go there. Um, yeah, I think it's I, sad. I think that's a whole other discussion, but you know, I, you know, a lot of times people complain that there's no more movie stars, but then one of the things I think that made movie stars, movie stars back in the day was that we didn't see them vulnerable and all their vulnerabilities on social media, we saw it in their performances on film because they were allowed to do it on film. And so that may not have been the person that we fell in love with. That's certainly wasn't the real person, but it was the person we knew. Right. You know? And that barrier is gone. And, and that's the deadly aspect of social media. When you break down that barrier, um, people may not buy it anymore. People, you know, they won't buy a performance anymore. And it's like, well, you don't, you don't, I believe in the idea of that form of privacy. You you separate the art uh, from what you are. But I don't I don't think you know the internet and everything moves so fast. I don't think people had time to really absorb uh, what was happening uh, sociologically. And to me, I have to think about that for the art. You know, I have to think about that. It sounds weird, but I know what you're where you're coming from. A hundred percent. It's like okay here's the performance. Now I'm, I'm, I'm glad enough that, you know, a lot of the people I work with, they're not social media whores, you know, they just don't go, they don't overdo it. And I mm -hmm. like that, but I still have to remind that there's promotion. You got to get yourself out there on that extent. But other than, other than that, you know, be careful, be very careful. It's, it's almost like that old saying familiarity breeds contempt, you know? Um, Absolutely. You know, so it, it is this weird catch 22 and, yeah, you know, and I'll stop there because I'm going to keep throwing out cliched statements and then we're going to be, you know, going into pun territory. At that point. <laughs> uh, so before I get to Frank Stallone, I will answer Hex's question. Yes, Cisco and Ebert did give two guilty pleasure thumbs up to Harley Davidson and the Marlboro Man. I hate uh, those guys. <laughs> I, I, guys. I will say for me personally, I don't want to spend more than 10 seconds on this. I thought that Mickey Rourke and Don Johnson were good with what they were given in that. I love watching them act, but, you know, the whole, everything else around it, you know, if I'm drunk and eating pretzels on a Friday night, I can watch that movie. And that's about all I'm going to say. So I can't, I can't get back. I can't get past <laughs> Don Johnson's mustache. It's over with. Oh, Sorry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So let's get to the third person uh, acting performance I wanted to bring up here. And this is a guy I had the great opportunity if you go you know click like and subscribe on comic crusaders youtube channel down below if you scroll down uh al uh al mega and i got the great uh honor to be able to interview frank stallone about a documentary about him um this and, guy and I'm, I'm bitter i was out of town i wanted in on that bad and i was yeah. gonna go to barfly i didn't care i was gonna go i was gonna ask him everything i could about barfly and Frank Stallone, you know, and there's two aspects I want to talk about with Frank Stallone. I'm going to talk about his performance in this movie, obviously, but I want to I want to get what your take on why he never blew up bigger as well. But, um, you know, Frank Stallone is one of the nicest guys I've been able, been fortunate enough to meet in doing this crazy, you know, my few years dipping into show business and everything. He's also crazy talented, as talented, if not more talented than his brother, as far as I'm concerned. Um, and so I watched this film and once again, he's, he's one of those people that, you know, that I'm going to steal one of your catchphrases. He's a scene stealer. He's, he does. He's, he's, he steals every scene. He, he is, he is a scene stealer in this film and he's a scene stealer in a lot of movies he's in. Um, and, but he's also a chameleon at times. He's got this weird trait where, uh, someone told me that he was in tombstone he was in the beginning and i was like the hell you say he's not a tombstone <laughs> he was, yeah. freaking liar you know and i went back and watched it I was like sure enough there he is with val kilmer and he's stealing the scene yeah. as a chameleon i'm like get the hell out of here so 
um, his performance in this film in particular. I mean, listen, he's not in it a ton. He's, you know, in the beginning and the end. But talk to me about what Frank Stallone brings to this. You know, that, that what he he and the dynamic between him and Mickey work and how they work is I think it's a beautiful thing. So. I, I, I think. At, at, yeah. Unfortunately, Hex, you're right. So, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think, I think he plays truth in the movie. I don't think he's a, a true protagonist, even though uh, Henry hates him to pieces. I think yeah. is, is truth. And that's what, what Henry hates. And I love the character because you know what? Um, Eddie, the character he plays, Eddie's right. He is right. Well, not only that, I, I'm going to get philosophical. You know, uh, I'm, I'm a writer. I tend to be indulgent that way sometimes. Um, I think that Eddie is a stand-in for the system, life. I'm going to beat the shit out of you to try and get you to comply and be fall in line. Henry's not having any of it. And he's going to beat the system back. You know, and sometimes which he, he rarely wins. <laughs> yeah, sometimes he wins, but yeah. it's not often. You right. know, so I, I think that those two are stand-ins for a greater philosophical discussion. So. It's true because I mean, you you have you know you have two opposing forces just smashing together, but they need each other to exist. You know, it. it I, I hate to use the analogy. It is the Batman Joker situation here. You know, you he needs to show up to the bar and he needs Eddie there to serve him. I mean, and he needs Eddie needs him to be there to serve to make. I mean, it is a vicious, disgusting circle. And that's why it works. But once again, you know, Frank Stallone steals those scenes, man. He is perfect. I couldn't imagine anybody playing that part but him. And I love yeah. it right down to the mustache and the polo shirts. And it's like, yeah, dude, it works. Frank is so talented. Um, you know, so his brother has the same talent, but I think Frank is more talented in his emotive ability than Sylvester is. Well, his ability he's not typecast like Sylvester Stallone. He's not typecast. He yeah. can go play a Western. He can go play a bar fly. You know, he, he can do that. So he's, I think he's, he's not uh, a victim of the system as much as Sly is. You know what I mean? I think, I think he has a, he has a lot of freedom and I think this is where it, it shows because once again, yeah, he's in a bar fly and yes, he is in tombstone. You know, he's a cowboy, he's a gambler and it's like, it works perfectly. And why not? Yeah. Um, and I love the character of Eddie, man. It just makes me laugh. It's, it's just like, we knew these people, we knew them. And it was like, God, I want to punch this guy so bad, but yeah, he's kind of all right, you know. Yeah, you know, I just think it's 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 insane, though. I mean, like I said, it's 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 the kind of thing when um, you know you write essays in school or whatever. If you're breaking down a film, you know, and you're tearing it apart from a philosophical standpoint or or greater messages or anything, that duality between Eddie and Henry is just I could write pages on it. And then when you throw in the third option, you know, the third part of that, which is uh, Faye Dunaway's character name is escaping me. For Wanda. For some Wanda. You know, when she go home, goes home with Eddie and then comes back to Henry, I mean, once again, it's a, it's a whole essay where you could talk about, you know, crazy attracts crazy or people go back, you know, or. But she you know, admitted she, it. She said, yeah. don't leave me alone. She said it. If a guy comes up with the fifth, I'm going with him. It, it, yeah. it, it was it was Henry's fault. It was his yep. fault. Yep. So, I mean, it's just and this goes back all the way to what we started at the beginning, which is Bukowski, because he's the one that wrote the screenplay. And um, yeah, man, it's just God. I, I can't believe that it's taken me this many years to watch it, but I really, the more you, and this is one of those films, the more you talk about it, the more you enjoy it. The more you think about it, the more you enjoy it. Um, that is rare. That's rare. It, and that's so, why, I mean, I threw it out there. This was a gamble. I was like, okay, I'm, you know, like blow up all that. I'm like, I'm throwing Barfly out there. I don't know what the boys are going to think, um, but I, I got to throw it out there because this is, this is a movie worth sitting down and well, watching. And not only that, when I first started watching the movie and the way it opens and everything, I was like, I had to pause. I was like, what the hell am I watching? What am I in for? And then it's like I had to settle in 
But then once I settled in and watched it, you know, it's one of those movies that gets you. But it's so different now, you know. And it's the difference between entertainment, you know, for entertainment's sake, and then entertainment that also makes me think and appreciate on dip- different levels. So I'll give you an example for me. Recently, I've watched two movies. Um, I enjoyed both of them immensely. One was this movie, Barfly. The other movie was John Wick 4. I'm not going to sit and analyze John Wick 4 forever. I'm not going to break it down. It's not a movie that the more I think about it, I'm going to get greater nuance and depth out of it. It was a moment, Terry, entertainment, which I can come back to over and over again for entertainment in that moment. But it's two different types of storytelling. And I think it's two different types of filmmaking that serve two different purposes. And we have a lot of the John Wick type storytelling now and nothing against John Wick. I like it. We don't get a lot of this barfly storytelling anymore. Uh, which I love. I love I love the the dirtiness of it. So a lot of times when people ask me where I came up with a line in a script or what was this experience. Now, those that know me were like, well, tell me the story behind this line. And I, I will have to stop things and tell people the story on set. And then they laugh or get horrified. And I said, well, that's the inspiration. And in, in, a, in, a, in a Bukowski sense, it's about the experience. And it's, I mean, obviously, and it's also relatable. I think a lot of people can relate to a bar fly, um, oh, yeah. especially our generation and, and, and before. Uh, but the thing is, is there like a John Wick four, nobody can relate to that. You know, it's, it's just pure fun entertainment. It's ridiculousness, yep. but a bar fly people may go, Oh my God, you know, this is my uncle did that or something, you know, they, they know. And the moment that happens, as a storyteller, you know you got them, and when you got them, that's that's gold. Uh, there, there. You know, when we go to closing comments, I'm gonna put it in my mind. I gotta remember. This brings me back to uh, a classic that I love to read and watch, which is Sherlock Holmes. And I'm gonna. There's a reason why I'm saying that. I want to go back, but I want to finish up with Frank Stallone before we wrap this up. So that begs a question. Frank is a talented singer. Uh, he could dance. He's a showman. He's an actor. He's had, you know, I think Frank would say this, moderate success, you know, moderate being, you know, a, you know, for a, a Hollywood person, Frank is wealthy, you know, he's done well for himself. But in terms of superstardom, he's not a superstar in Hollywood. What, you know, is it come down to what Heck said? Is it nice guys finish last? Or why is it that Frank, was so successful in what he can do and yet never got that chance to be uh, on his own. Is it all have to do with Sylvester? I mean, we, we, when we did the interview with him, we actually brought this up and he adamantly says, no, you know, Sylvester was his biggest fan and wanted him to have that success. But for whatever reason, it didn't happen. What do you think? I, I, I think honestly, it was, it was Sylvester Stallone. I mean, come on, he's his brother. And it was yeah. a different era of, of, of Hollywood, godness you know uh when you look at a rocky and you really look at how well the story was written stallone wrote that that is genius it Mm. is absolute genius and then rocky is like barfly is another one of those movies that kind of just doesn't pull any punches on the grittiness of it right and it all came together and then all of a sudden you're you're a hollywood legend you you are Rocky. You are Rambo. You're typecast. But he makes a Rocky, which is gritty. And then it turns into the shambles that it has turned into now. He makes a First Blood, which is John Rambo, which turns into the shambles that we have now. So that's already, you already got two oh. iconic characters that have transcended, good or bad. And now you're the brother of that. As a fan of the action series, I will also say that the first of action movies, I'll say that what he did writing and directing and starring in the first Expendables versus what it came in is the same thing, where he took the Hollywood movie trope of action movies, turned it on its head, did something different with it, and then it became the it movie to be in type thing. So. Right, right. And and like I'll say, I'll say it again. I, I'm I was upset I missed that interview. I was behind the scenes with you guys. Oh. Remember, I was talking about it, and then I, I had to go out of town. Uh, and, I was like, man, I was going to be all over him about Barfly. I was. And by the way, 
Mickey Rourke is in the first Expendables and steals all the scenes he's in. So, yeah, all right, I'll try. <laughs> I haven't gone the Expendables route. I probably uh, never will, but uh, you have to be into action movies. You know, it, it is an action movie at heart. You know, but the, what he does with it. I mean, that's we can have that topic another time because we're talking about Barfly right now. So yeah, 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 yeah. So, um, so let's do closing comments on this movie and wrap this thing up. Now, going back, you know, I'm surprised I didn't forget about it. I will say that the scenes in the bar and the scenes back in the alley took me back to something else, and it's Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, the way he would describe Victorian London, the bad parts, you know, Whitechapel. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then when it was captured on film, specifically like in the Granada TV series with uh, Jeremy Brett, um, it was dirty. It was dangerous. It was ugly. The people, the women, you know, the, the women and men, they weren't glamorized at all. The drinking culture. Take that from 1890s London and fast forward it to 1980s America and it gave me that same exact feel and it's that slice of life a look at a different part of life that even if I don't walk through it somehow or another because of the human condition I can identify with it and that was the thing that I took the most out of the film even though I loved everything about it it took me back to that and it, it's one of those things I can't quantify I can't tell you and and when I was thinking about it and was going to bring it up with you I was like Lance is going to think I'm nuts because this took me back to 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 Whitechapel and and Sherlock Holmes, but it did, and I loved it. I loved it because it feels dangerous and dirty and real and lived in and actual people. And for a moment, I was outside of myself, walking alongside these people in a different time and place, and transported. And so that, to me, is the beauty of this film. And I really. You know, I'm grateful that you brought this up. You know, I'm grateful that you suggested it. So that is my wrap up on the film. What about you? What, what are your final thoughts on Barfly? I, I just think it's it's a show, it's a social commentary. You know, a hundred percent. And I I love I love the aspect of that. And I think that it's identifiable. I think people can watch it and go, Oh yeah, you know, that's I knew I've been in a scenario like that. I think there is a closeness. Uh, uh, to the subject matter more than people want to even realize. I think people are in denial a lot of times. And I think this movie might jar them, uh, jar memories. And I love that. Um, and, and I have to even say like the, 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 the older woman who is like sucking a golf ball through a garden hose for 20 bucks, you know? And it's like, and it's just like, it's dirty and nasty, but they didn't have to show her doing anything. I, it's the innuendo and the dialogue. Yeah. yeah. And it's, and, but, and it feels real, but, and you're like, I'm, I'm, a, I don't know why I'm here for it, but I'm here for it. And, and it happens the first five minutes of the film. And it is, I remember people laughing, just you yeah. could in the movie theater. It was, and that's once again, you, this woman is probably a glamorous, you know, old Hollywood actress. She, mm -hmm. uh, I think her name in the movie was grandma Moses. And they had to put her in wardrobe and she had to say these heinous lines and she went there with well, a smile. <laughs> and then the understated humor, like one of the, one of the things I will say real quick, one of the lines that made me laugh is that another time she's with this old man and they come out from the back and he's like, he's like, my God, you're so, it was something to the effect of you're so good that I have no soul left or something. Yeah, like that, you know, or, everything out of me. I, yeah. And, and, and I love that, you know, um, and, and that's kind of what I, I, I want to kind of go there. I, and I tell people this, like, we got to go there and what I do, because it's going to be, it could be heinous. It could be something that, that you may be uncomfortable with, but the point is, is, you know, you've been there or somebody has been there, you know, this. Yeah. So I, I just love the grittiness of it. And it's, to me, it's honest and you don't get that honesty anymore. Let's a forced joke. It's shock yeah. value. This didn't play on that. This was just dialogue and it worked. And, and I think what you said is it's honest. And I also think it's brave because there are, especially in today's day and age, there's going to be, there would be people that would, would want to tear you apart for that. But let's be honest when the cameras aren't on us, 
when nobody is around and we're with friends or people we're comfortable with, we we say things and do things and talk about stuff in ways that we don't talk about in our public face, our public voice. We become very Japanese in that way, where we have different faces, different voices for depending on who the audience is, you know? So. And, and I, I'm sitting there writing it down because I'm like, uh-uh, this is a great story. I'm going to go there and I'm going to try and put it in a story somehow. So when people think that, oh, you're a genius, you wrote, and well, this actually kind of happened. All I did is try to bring the magic back of the story. And that goes right back to what Bukowski was saying, what we were talking about at the beginning, which was looking, listening. Yes, you know, don't um, try wait for it to happen. And and I'm like, right now I'm waiting, you know, I, I have something in mind, but I'm waiting. So mm -hmm. Bukowski's the man. I, well, he's not a perfect role model, not in the, in the least bit, but literarily, I think he was a good journalist. He just captured it. So, mm -hmm. you know, in summation, I mean, this is, this is why this film is worth watching. Not the performances, the directing, the photography, Everything is to 100% top notch for this little tiny indie movie, and mm -hmm. this is what we need nowadays. So this is why I'm I'm promoting it. Yeah, definitely. And I would say, not only is it great from a filmmaking standpoint, it's great from an art standpoint. If you're an artist, if you're a, a writer, you know, there's there's things you could take away from this film and the, its approach for what you do as well. You know, as an artist, sometimes um, too often we want to. You know, and there's a place for this, but, you know, the superhero is, is is super strong and everything. Sometimes we need to draw a vulnerable character, a character that has flaws and stuff like that. You know, not all the time, but depending on what you're doing and what kind of emotions you want to convey. All of that fits into that. You know, be brave. Be brave. Absolutely. You know, and, you know, your art, you're going to suffer for it. So, I mean, that's just mm -hmm. the way it is. Like like Bukowski said, you know, um, you know, nobody suffers more than the poor baby. You know, and artists, sometimes that's where they come from. Uh, yeah. you, you sometimes, got, sometimes the superhero is an unassuming dude with a pair of magic scissors, you know? So, exactly. You, know. you suffer for it, too. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. All right. Thank you, everybody, for watching this episode of Cinema Crusaders. I want to thank Lance so much for recommending this and being here on Cinema Crusaders with me. And thank you. Hope you took a drink for me. I so, did. Awesome. Uh, I want to thank all of you out there for watching. Please make sure you click like and subscribe to the Comic Crusaders channel. We're here every Friday afternoon, 4 p.m. Pacific, Friday evening over there in the on the East Coast, 7 p.m. Uh, over in the U.K., we're on at midnight, you know, so if you can't catch us at midnight, catch us on the replay on the YouTube or, you know, on Twitter and stuff like that. So on behalf of myself and Lance, Cinema Crusaders, the Undercover Capes Podcast Network, and Comic Crusaders. Make sure you keep that popcorn warm. Find a comfy chair. Cozy up with the movie you like. And this has been Cinema Crusaders. We are out of here. See Bye, ya. everybody.